This probably contains plot spoilers regarding the film Django Unchained, 2012 film directed by Quentin Tarantino. Won't be much of a plot spoiler to anyone who knows Tarantino films to say, yes, there was a big shootout. Big surprise, but uh, it was a great film. I watched it last night and it was only when I put it on the telly and saw that it was on YouTube and saw that it was two hours and 45 minutes. I realised that this was yet another cinema marathon of mine. I've been watching all these really long films lately, but sure. Anyway, um, it's an interesting film, a very interesting film. Um, It is set in Texas and Mississippi a few years, only a handful of years before the outbreak of the US Civil War. The US Civil War was the crowning moment, really, of the modern United States, in much the same way that you could say that the 1967 Six-Day War was what created the modern State of Israel. Okay, the State of Israel existed from 1948, but it was Israel's victory in 1967 that created the modern State of Israel, really. Um, The US Civil War was what created the modern United States. After the Civil War, it was decided that there should be the creation of one legal entity called the United States of America. Believe it or not, before the Civil War, there was no such legal entity as the United States of America. And the Civil War was a catalyst to bringing the states into a much closer union. It was by force that 13 states were not allowed to secede, by force. It's always about money, though. That's what John Lydon says, and he's right. Because, and again, I'm just reiterating one more time, this is a plot spoiler. The story sees the two main protagonists, Django, played by Jamie Foxx, brilliantly. Brilliant actor, Jamie Foxx. Brilliant actor. And another great actor, Christoph Waltz, played a German bounty hunter who was pretending to be a dentist. And this bounty hunter freed... Django, who had been a slave, went and bought him and um, Django ended up becoming a a partner of this bounty hunter and they both made quite a lot of money as bounty hunters. Um, Django's wife was also a slave and both he and his partner discovered where his wife was incarcerated as a slave and she was incarcerated she'd been sold (coughs) legally or immorally if you like it was legal actually slavery was legal this is how it goes to show that just because something's legal does not make it moral um but Django's wife um Brunhilde had been incarcerated in the candy estate Candyland even within the standards of slavery, Candyland was notorious for its mistreatment of its slaves. The owner of Candyland was played by Calvin Candy. It was played by Leonardo DiCaprio. Yet another brilliant DiCaprio performance. Brilliant actor DiCaprio. So this film had brilliant actors in it. had Jamie Foxx, it had Christoph Waltz, it had Leonardo DiCaprio. It had some brilliant, brilliant, brilliant actors, actors in it. Nobody in the analysis of the film really says the truth about Calvin Candy, that he was a raving, flaming psychopath. He had inherited that particular estate from both his father and grandfather. There are many analyses of the story. I'll digress slightly from what I'm getting at by talking about um, Stephen, who was the chief butler of the estate. Stephen was a black man. Candy employed black people. That's because they were cheap. It's the only reason why Candy employed black people, because they were cheap. Um, Catherine Austin Fitz, in a recent excellent video, states that slavery has, over world history, been the most profitable industry of all. She may well be right, I haven't done my own research in that, but I will take her word for it. So the Candy estate in Mississippi, and I want to point out this is all fictional as far as I'm concerned, I'm just recounting the story of the film uh, Django Unchained the Candy estate was an extremely wealthy estate but this was built on the back of slavery in other words it was built on the back of a terrible evil 
Candy, played by DiCaprio, was the third generation owner of this estate. His chief butler, Stephen, I forget that I don't have the name of the actor to hand here. Um, actually, I can say it was Samuel L. Jackson played Stephen. Stephen was a scumbag. He was 75 in the role, played by Samuel L. Jackson. Very well played. They, you know, there was a serious cast in this film. But Tarantino gets serious casts and is a very brilliant director. Um, <clears throat> Stephen was the chief butler and ba- basically the boss of the estate on behalf of Mr. Candy. He was a black man. He was a total Uncle Tom. He was absolutely brainwashed into his servitude and his slavery because all of those people who worked in the all those black people who worked in the estate were slaves however much they may have been indulged by the psychopath in charge they were slaves Stephen adored his slavery and this is what we're seeing today with the Rona hoax and the masks and all of these things we are seeing within even let's take all the people who are wearing masks at the moment there are many of them who don't want to and there are many of them who have stated their admiration to the anti-maskers for their courage the courage of the anti-maskers in defying this and giving two fingers to the bullying regarding masks but then there are those who love it who actually love their servitude wearing masks these are the same ones who will grass on people for not wearing a mask in the supermarket and i'm seeing that on twitter again today Another individual is boasting about reporting three elderly nuns to the Gardaí for going to a supermarket without masks. Perdition upon anyone who does that kind of thing. Perdition. Perdition upon them for doing that kind of thing. May they never be let live that down because eventually this whole mask thing will come to an end. You know, in 1940, people thought Hitler was there forever. Hitler was talking about a 1,000-year empire. Well, it only lasted four, didn't it? So much for that, Hitler, huh? Mind you, there was a huge collateral for Hitler's delusion, and there's going to be a huge collateral for the present delusion regarding the Rona hoax. But anyway, this estate, the Candy estate, and this is getting back as... Well, no, let's talk about Stephen briefly. Stephen was a black man. He was played brilliantly by Samuel L. Jackson. He was the head of the estate on behalf of Mr. Candy. He was a sycophantic, toadying creep. He was completely, completely, completely brainwashed to be the loving slave of this, literally a slave, but also mentally a slave of the psychopath who owned the estate. He was his enabler, and to an extent, Candy was his. He ended up being killed, in the end, by Django. But Django killed him in a beautiful way. He didn't just shoot him to death. He burnt him alive in the big house of the estate, which is actually this horrible big timber shack. When Django blew the thing up, it went up like, you know, like matchwood you had your plot spoiler alert earlier sorry guys uh, a lot of the film was a lot of fantasy insofar as the ability of Django to shoot his way out of a barrage of bullets that wouldn't happen in real life but you must remember it's fantasy it's a, an adventure film in a way it has a lot of the qualities of an old fashioned cowboys and Indians film it did have a lovely ending um, Django was reunited with his wife they were both free they had their papers to confirm that they were free and obviously they were going to head north. Um, that does not mean that they would be second class citizens. No, no, no. Even freed blacks were not second class citizens. The second class citizens were the Native Americans or in those days called the Indians. The blacks were third class citizens. Whether they were freed or slaves, well, if they were slaves, they were seventh class citizens. They were treated, cattle wouldn't be treated as bad as some of the slaves were treated. But, you know, even the freed blacks, you know, were not treated well. You can see, and this actually does lend itself to where the certain degree of anger and righteous anger regarding Black Lives Matter has come from. 
don't let anybody suggest the blacks were properly treated in the United States. They weren't. So, you know, To Kill a Mockingbird is another example of that. The Colour Purple is another example of that. That's how our, how the United States, particularly the southern states of the US, differ from Ireland. We never had slavery in this country. After we became independent in 1922, we were the first English-speaking country in the world to introduce an equal vote for men and women. We've always had, you know, women have always had the vote here in independent Ireland. We never had slavery here. We've never had discriminate. We've never had laws that discriminate against people on basis of skin color. This is not a racist country, whatever filth anybody's coming out with. This is not a racist country, and we are not a racist people. I digress, because I've digressed quite far from what I see as an important message of Django Unchained. I saw a video recently by uh, Catherine Austin Fitz. Brilliant video about the lockdown I don't know the name of it and I'll just look at it Catherine Austin Fitz Planet Lockdown now Planet Lockdown has not yet been released as a movie I don't know why I can't think if you watch the interview with her you know you'll get your hints but having said that there's an excellent 40 or so minute interview with Catherine Austin Fitz on YouTube I recommend it be watched it's actually linked below anyway What Catherine Austin Fitz talks about is what's happening now, and I agree with her 100%. Her research is brilliant. There's nothing tinfoil hat about her. But what is happening at the moment is a major, major relocation of of wealth in relation to actual land and property. That happened at and after the US Civil War. Because if we look back at Django Unchained, the Candy estate is based, its wealth, its extreme wealth, is based on slavery. What happens when slavery is abolished? There goes the wealth. Django only really, by torching the big house of the Candy estate, killing Calvin Candy, killing the people, his sister. He had a really creepy, according to, to that story, he had a really creepy relationship with his sister. He kissed her on the lips and ugh, he was a creep. I was motivated to look at this film simply because there's a meme that's been going around for a while in 2020 of Leonardo DiCaprio holding a glass of wine with the smirk in his face and it's appearing a lot you know it's the middle-aged man sneering at bullshit that's how it has been construed so I said I have to see this film that meme and the use of that meme is not entirely parallel to the actual character that the meme came from the character Calvin Candy is a psychopath a very evil man a sadist he was sadistic about his slaves um he was engaged in a thing called mandingo which was fighting to the death between two slaves you know um he he treated them very much like i think ivan the great played soldier games with real soldiers that's a comparison i'd see ivan the great played soldier games with real soldiers you know that's how this character in this film which i assume is fictitious behaved with his slaves he would pit two very fit black men together and he'd get them to fight to the death and he'd do it as entertainment and they bet on it and you know on one occasion he's interrupted he's interrupted by um he's interrupted by dr schultz and Django. And he gets up from his seat and he turns around to the two men fighting. He says, keep fighting, niggers. You know, he, he, it was psychopathic. It was, and then later on, the next day, a man who had been a prize fighter for his, of his, was tied to a tree with barking dogs, circling it. And he was being punished for his not having, for his losing his talent as one of these prize fighters. And in front of Dr. Schultz and Django, um, Calvin Candy sets these dogs on this man who had only won for him, who had only fought for him. He sets them on him and the man is torn to death by these hungry dogs. That was a sadistic psychopath, a cruel, depraved psychopath. And DiCaprio plays it brilliantly. DiCaprio is such a good actor. Such a good actor, such an intelligent, deep actor. I saw him then earlier, Thomas Sheridan, and said, watch The Aviator. I did. Again, DiCaprio was fabulous in it. He's a fabulous actor, Leonardo DiCaprio. Fabulous actor. Apparently, he's also a genuinely nice guy. 
I don't know, he hasn't called by to my house for a cup of coffee or a cigarette or anything. But having said that, he doesn't have a reputation for being difficult or for being a diva. He couldn't have, he couldn't be that successful. He couldn't be that successful otherwise, you know. Um, I still haven't got to the point. I'm looking at the counter here, or after 15 minutes, I haven't got to the point. The point is that an entire collection of wealth across the southeast of the United States collapsed quickly as a direct result of the US Civil War because that whole economy or so much of that economy was based upon reliance upon slavery. Once the slavery ended, so did the income stream. So all of the, and that happened within a period of about five years. So what we saw in the film was, irrespective of the fact then that Calvin Candy was killed, and Stephen, the butler, was, oh, Calvin, my Cal, was crying over, you know, the man who had enslaved him for 75 years. Aside from the fact that Candy was killed, his, his number was going to be up within the next five years. All of those slave owners and plantation owners, they were finished five years from then onwards. And it reminds us of these politicians here in Ireland today. They're like those ones now because their number's up. Whether they're aware of it or not. And however much the trajectory takes, their number's up. Fine Gael, at the end of 2020, published a video, our bloopers for this year. And a lot of people were saying, can they actually be serious with this? Given the year that's been in it, they've put up this video of Simon Harris and Helen McEntee and Faradkar and these ones, you know, doing all of their spin videos and their outtakes, their bloopers. Yes, they're serious. In the same way that Calvin Candy would have been serious about what he was doing. In the same way that the Romanovs, as Thomas Sheridan talked about in his utterly brilliant, I'll link it in again to this, Velocity of Now from the other night. He was, you know, the Romanovs are serious. They didn't know that forces were gathering against them. Rasputin was telling the Romanovs this, a very brilliant um, seer, Rasputin was, and a shaman. Oh, no, 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 they weren't listening. No, no, no. Calvin Candy wasn't listening. The fact that even this man, Schultz, came up the driveway with um, Django riding a horse, that should have been an augury, a straw in the wind of what was coming. Times were changing. A black man riding a horse caused great offence in towns in Texas because they were like that, <laughs> you know. But the fact that this white German man, ostensibly a dentist, actually a bounty hunter, had as his second in command and his business partner, a black man, a freed slave. That was the way the trend was going. That should have said enough to anybody who was watching symbolism and semiotic. But no, 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 no. No. That's what's happening now. So Fine Gael came out with this blooper video, our outtakes of 2020. And sure, as people were saying, the biggest blooper happened in February when people voted them back in. This is how out of touch Fine Gael are. People, how can you possibly be so out of touch after the year that's gone, people were saying. But yes, they are out of touch. Doesn't surprise me. I'm sure I don't speak for Thomas Sheridan. I would assume it wouldn't surprise Thomas Sheridan if he saw that Fine Gael outtakes video. But you don't have to look at it. It would make you die a cringe. It's like when people talked about looking at Medusa. You looked at Medusa and you could never unsee it. I don't want to look at these Fine Gael videos. I can't unsee these things, particularly Varadkar and his simpleton smug face and his Billy Whiz from the Beano haircut. I can't unlook at these things. I think Varadkar is a repulsive individual. From the moment Varadkar became Taoiseach, although actually from a short time before then, I found, I say this earnestly, I found it repulsive to just look at Varadkar. I found it repulsive to just look at him. In a previous video I talked about Phil Linnett. You know, you look at Phil Linnett, you want to look at him more. There's an actress called Elizabeth Banks. I find her a very charismatic woman to look at. 
whenever she's acting in something, even if she's not speaking, you find your eyes drawn to her. That's real charisma. Elizabeth Banks is real charisma. The limited real charisma. Varadkar is a charisma. He has anti-charisma. He's the anti-matter of charisma. You don't want to look at him. You don't want to hear the drone speak and spell voice from Varadkar. You know, I'm not joking when I say this. I'm not exaggerating that. You don't want to... I, you know, if Varadkar comes on the telly, although... I've tuned the box off RTE for New Year's resolution. Don't tell my parents. Don't tell them. But, you know, I'd have to switch off or leave the room if Radker came on. I mean that earnestly. I did not want to be in any way subjected to Varadkar's voice or the look on his face. I only ever saw darkness. I only ever saw a void. And it's a void filled by demons. This is what Thomas talks about. So Candy was living the high life in this estate in Mississippi. The house was built, obviously, from matchwood and cardboard by the looks of it. But those estate houses were, they still are, those Mac mansions you get, particularly in America. There's somewhat better building regulations in Ireland, but only just. They're all flimsy pieces of rubbish, those Mac mansions. And this is what Candy lived in. So when Django dynamites it at the end, the whole place goes up and is a ruin in ten minutes. And Stephen... That sycophantic slave who loved his his servitude, Stephen, was incinerated alive in there. It was a fantasy. That film was very unlikely to have happened in real life. Um, but it was enjoyable to watch. It was, as I said, total Tarantino, you know, guns everywhere and all of that but Tarantino is a very gifted film director I think he's great you know you see him being interviewed though and he gets these simpy interviewers who say do you not think there shouldn't be that much violence in your movies and his attitude is don't watch you don't like it you know don't watch Quentin Tarantino doesn't go to people's houses and say come and watch my film no choice here you know I think there's a good enough warning to people that they're going to be watching something that's quite gory I didn't think it was too gory. I thought actually the level of violence in the film was appropriate. I didn't think there was anything offensive or particularly over the top about it. You know, um, much more controversial would be his use of the word nigger. The word nigger appeared in it all the time. And it was used in a commodified sense. In other words, Candy was saying, that's my nigger. Or, you know, we're going to buy this nigger or we're going to buy that nigger. Candy used it. It's interesting to see. Candy used it even then in an offensive way because even then it was an offensive word. And the slaves referred to them, who's that nigger? They'd say, you know, that's one line from it. But even in those days, nigger was an offensive word. And Candy was aware that he was talking about human beings, these slaves. And he enjoyed, you could say, DiCaprio was brilliant. He, you know, he should have won a prize for that role. He got over Candy's sadism. Probably his sexual creepiness about it. He was probably getting off on it. You know, when he wasn't kissing his sister on the lips. These are the times we're in now. These are the times we're in now. Fine Gael are coming out with these blooper videos. The politicians are now talking about the death of... Um, that man in Blanchardstown a few days ago you know they've come out on the wrong side here because although you know there's now going to be a Garda Ombudsman inquiry into what happened there I think whatever beef a lot of people might have with the Garda they're generally not notorious of being trigger happy we don't have an armed police force in this country we don't have an armed police force and you know, if the race baiters like Breed Smith and, you know, Hazel Chu and all these ones, and Aon O'Reardon, Alan Kelly, all these cynical race baiters keep at it, then we will eventually need an armed police force. They're trying to cause trouble, these ones, Breed Smith. They're trying to cause trouble. Well, we'll get it. You look for trouble, you'll get it. It's like the people who don't wear masks. And then, you know, they, you know, de, de wall on these ones. They're looking for trouble and they'll get it. But... This was like the Romanovs. These very, very wealthy slave owners who are living high in the hog and abusing everybody around them. And every time this psychopath, you know, Calvin Candy would make a joke, all of his sick fans, ah, ha, 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 they were so used to laughing at him. But he was about to meet his maker. 
he was about to be killed that night at the dinner, as indeed was Schultz, and his estate would be torched by the next day, would be burnt down by the next day. And even if that hadn't happened, he'd have lost everything within four or five years when slavery collapsed. When, well, no, when slavery was abolished and when all of the money that surrounded it was collapsed, had collapsed. The result of the defeat of the Confederacy in the American Civil War meant that there were these ruined estates. First of all, the whole 13 states of the Confederacy were in bits. But secondly, those very wealthy plantations no longer could rely on slavery. So what did this do? It caused an enormous economic depression in the 13 states. <clears throat> and what did this do? It allowed the big money from the other states, from the north, to move in and acquire all of those assets at a knockdown rate. And that's why I'm leaving you now and saying that you should watch that video linked below from Catherine Austin Fitz.